All right, let's see what we did in the last class. We started chapter number two, right? We started looking at chapter number two, which is circuit elements. Even before we started a chapter number two, we already had this guy in back, right? The passive sign convention. Now, we looked at voltage and current sources. A voltage source has a set constant voltage across its terminals, independent of what is externally connected. Okay? It provides a constant voltage. Similarly, a constant current source, a current source provides a constant current through its terminals to the load circuit, independent of what is connected to the load or the external circuit. Okay, and then the voltage across the terminals could vary, but the current is going to be constant or set. That's what we discussed in the last class. That's about independent sources, right? But then there's another class of sources that is called dependent sources. And to, in today's class, we are going to talk about dependent sources. We are going to look at problems, KCL and KVL, involving dependent sources. Okay, there can be four kinds of dependent sources. Okay, on the left, I have drawn dependent voltage sources. Because you see the symbol plus and minus, that signifies a voltage source. So clearly the one on the top and the one on the bottom are voltage sources. It, it provides a constant voltage that is dependent on some input variable, okay? If the input variable is current, then I have a current controlled voltage source. That's the one on the bottom left, okay? If the input is voltage, then I have a voltage control voltage source. Similarly, on the right, I have shown two current sources. See the arrows pointing up? Both of these are dependent current sources. Because in both of these cases, the output is current. The output shown as green highlight, that's current, okay? When the output is current, we call this a current source. And the current is dependent on some variable. If the variable is voltage, we call it a voltage controlled current source. If it is current, we call it a current controlled current source. Okay, please bear with me for the moment. If uh, you're, uh, if you, it becomes much more clear when we look at some problems. Okay, so we looked at independent sources and dependent sources. Okay, independent sources and dependent sources. Then we moved on to talking about Ohm's law, which simply says V is I times R, okay? When I say Ohm's law, this should come to your mind. V is I R, or any other manifestation of this relationship. I is V over R, or R is V over I. Okay, so on and so forth. This is what should, um, this is the image that should conjure up in your mind, LA system. The voltage across its terminals is V. The current flowing through the resistance is I, and the resistance is R. Okay, now we went on to talking about power. Okay, power is V times I. If the power is positive, we call it absorbing. If the power is negative, we call it delivering. Okay, the power can manifest in one of three forms. Power across a resistance can be uh, V squared times R or I squared times R or it could also be V times I. There are three manifestations of power across a resistance. 
If you know the voltage across the resistance and current through the resistance, then you simply take the product of these two to get the power. Okay, you can also express the power in terms of purely the voltage V squared over R or purely the current through the resistor I squared over R. Okay. Then we talked about kickoff's loss or kickoff's loss. Two more tools added to your tool set, right? The two tools are Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. We started with Kirchhoff's current law, which says if you add, if you look at a node, so Kirchhoff's current law always pertains to currents at a node. Okay, that is the purview of Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's current law, okay? In the last class, when I, show, when I was showing you the Kirchhoff's current law, I forgot to add I6. So that's a correction you want to add, okay? And the notes are going to be updated with the correction, okay? But uh, the idea is the sum of all the currents at a node is zero, conservation of charge, okay? There is no current at a node, okay? There is no current at a node, okay? And in order to solve that, how do you apply it? Well, I showed two techniques for you, okay? Both are essentially the same. These two techniques, even though they appear different, they're essentially the same. The first technique in applying KCL is to Consider all the currents coming in as negative and all the currents going out as positive. At a node, all the currents coming in are considered as negative and all the currents going out are considered as positive. Okay, that's just one technique. Okay, another technique that I prefer is to look at all the currents coming in, add them to one side of the equation, Look at all the currents going out, leave them or add them on the other side of the equation, equate the two sides, then you don't have to worry about sign anymore. It's just the magnitude. So the idea is the sum of currents coming in is equals to the sum of currents going out. That will automatically take care of, that will automatically take care of the sign. Okay, so we looked at KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's current law. Then we also looked at Kirchhoff's voltage law, which pertains to voltages dropped around a closed path. Okay, around a closed path. What is the idea of a closed path? You begin at a node, you traverse a path, come back and end at the same node. That's the idea of a path, closed path. Okay. Kirchhoff's voltage law has to do, it pertains to paths, closed paths, okay? And here I identified two paths, and then the convention is to start at the lower left corner, follow a path in a clockwise direction until you end up at the same node again, okay? That's what we did. That's what we did in the last class, okay? And then we looked at some problems. We looked at two problems. The first problem had a bunch of resistors. We were asked to find I1, I2, I3, I4, and Is, given that I0 was two amperes. Then what we did was to set up KCL and then uh, move on to move on to doing the next step. Okay, set up KCL at node A, identify all the nodes, A, B, C, D, these are all the different nodes. I identify all the nodes, set up KCL at these nodes, and then if I need more equations, then I have to do KVL as well. Then in addition to the equations, one, two, three, four, that I did here, I needed two more equations, okay? In order to arrive at those two equations, in order to set up those equations, I used KVL around loop alpha, shown in purple here, and 
loop beta shown in blue highlight here. That gave me a total of six equations. Two equations probably were identical. So even though it appeared like six equations, I only had five equations. So from these five equations, I had five unknowns and I was able to solve for that, okay? And then we'll talk about this some more, okay? And then we looked at another example. Let's take a closer look at this example, okay? Let's see, um, questions please. What questions do you have so far? What questions do you have so far? Everything looks pretty good. Okay, good. So let's see, um, let's revisit the problem that we were doing yesterday, example problem number two, and see how we did retrace our steps. Let's retrace our steps. We looked at four nodes, node A on the top, node B toward the east, node C all the way south, node e, D, D as in delta, delta to the west, west of the circuit, okay? So four nodes gave me four equations through KCL. Then I figured I needed more. I figured I needed more equations, okay? What were the equations I need? So in order to do that, I started out by setting up, okay? KVL. The first KVL I set up, if I go down here, was the along the purple path, along the pink path. Okay, along the pink path. So here is my question for you. Think about why I chose that pink path for setting up KVL. Um, because it Can you say that again? Your voice is not 100% uh, audible. Sorry about that. Um, because it contains more knowns, uh, it contains the source voltage, so it's easier to solve for. And also, we sure. know what the current one is. Correct. Thank you. I think you got it right. If you look at this node and forget just about everything else, just look at the purple path that I have shown here and retrace the path. Well, I'm looking at the voltages along the path. I know this, that's a known voltage. Similarly, that's the first part. The next element is this guy, okay? The voltage across that guy is 90 volts given. I know that. Then the next part in the path is this guy. That's the unknown. So if you think about it, it makes sense to choose this overall big path because along the path, there are more knowns and only one unknown, okay? So when I set up the equation by writing, sorry about that, by writing the KVL, I begin at the lower left node, okay? Following a clockwise path, okay? When I set up the equation, the first, voltage that I encounter is negative 240 volts. So sure enough, at the very bottom of the page, I showed that negative 240 volts plus the next element is 90 volts, the 22.5 ohms resistance. So that's a known. And then the next path, the next element in the path is the 15 ohm resistance, which is through I2. So it turns out, when I set up the equation, what I found out was that it seems I2 is the only unknown. And it's very convenient for me because I2 is the only unknown, everything else is known. The value of I2 falls out, okay? So that's a convenient technique I use to pick that path, okay? If I pick, in other words, if I picked this path instead, okay? Let's use a different color. Let's use, uh, I don't know, the green color, okay? If I used this path instead, then I would end up writing an equation in I3 times 20 ohms, that's negative, plus I4 times five, 
plus I2 times 15. So there are three unknowns, I3, I4, and I2. And that's not to my taste, that's distasteful. Uh, I cannot, it's, it only adds to the clutter, okay? So when setting up KVL, I chose the path in such a manner as to make things easy for me, okay? Once I know I2, okay, I know I2, this guy, and I know the current coming in I1, four amperes, because the voltage across that is given to be 90 volts. So I know I1 and I2, then at node B, using KCL at node B, or in other words, the equation that we already set up, okay? I already set up the equation for node B, I2 is I1 plus I4. I2 is known, I1 is known, so it's a matter of algebra to find out the value of I4. So what I'm doing is I'm not only setting up equations, I'm not doing equations in a blind manner, but I'm trying to simplify and reduce the number of unknowns at each step, okay? So now I know the value of I1, I2, and I4. Then it makes sense to set up a KVL in this manner so that I1, I4, and I5 are in an equation but then I know I1 and I4 already. And that's exactly the reason why I set up a KVL around loop beta, the green loop, okay? So if you think about it, there is four times negative I5 plus 90 volts, that's already given across the 22.5 ohm resistance on the right. And in the middle, there is a five ohm resistance, negative five times I4, I4 value is already known. So the idea is using the known values, I should be able to find out unknowns, okay? And I choose KVL in a very judicious, carefully chosen manner, okay? That uh, my decision to pick the loops for KVL are informed by what simplifies my circuit. Make sense? Let's see if we can solve the problem. Let's see if we can do an example problem. What I want you to do is I want you to take this, um, take a few minutes to solve part I, part one of this simple circuit, okay? It's not a complicated circuit. We, deal, we dealt with a bit more um, intricate circuit yesterday. Now, for practice, I want you to work on a simple circuit. Take about five minutes to see if you can find the value for I naught in this circuit, okay? All right, let's see. Uh, any volunteers, any answers? The value for I naught? Uh, I, I got the equations, but I didn't actually get to see what the resistance was across I naught. I naught, okay. Sorry about that. That's 10 ohms. Okay, thanks. 10 ohms. Okay. So that's good. Uh, what we can do is um, we can go ahead and uh, take your help in getting us started with the equations, okay? That way, um, it's not just me talking all the way, all along, okay? Let's look at two nodes here. The first thing I'm going to do is to define the nodes, two nodes, A and B, okay? And then, uh, so maybe you can help me get started with the equations. Sure, I actually don't see the screen right now. You don't? Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. My bad, I don't know how that happened. Okay, okay. sorry about that. So uh, let's see, um, let's start with KCL at node A. Okay, let's start with KCL at node A. And I'm going to call this current, 
this guy. If you will allow me, I want to call this as I x. That's the current flowing down. Okay, so let's set up KCL at node A. Okay. So I got um, I x is equal to six plus I naught. Thank you, that is correct. The currents coming in are six amperes and then I naught. That's equal to the current leaving, which is I x. Okay, so you can set up KCL at node B as well, but I'm pretty sure it's going to give you the exact same result because it's a trivial um, equation. They, they, they're redundant equations. So if you were to set up KVL, KCL at node B, the current coming in is IX, okay? And the current leaving is this six amperes and then this I naught, okay? Because that's the same current flowing through the 120. So six amperes plus I naught, okay? So even though it seems like we set up two equations, it really is just one equation, okay? Then how do we, how do we set up the KVL then? So that's all the nodes we have, okay? So now we have to think about setting up KVL. So I set alpha to be the clockwise loop on the left. Like so. And uh, what, I, what I got for that is uh, negative 120 uh, plus. Just give me one second. Okay. okay. So KVL, you're fast. I'm not as Sorry. fast as you are. So give me a second to catch up with you. KVL along loop alpha okay so this is loop alpha and i'm going to begin at the lower left corner and follow a clockwise path all right all caught up okay um so negative 120 uh then that's gonna be plus 10 i naught and then that's gonna be uh, plus 50 i x is equal to zero all of that equals to zero. So now I have two equations. Ix equals to six plus I naught is one equation. Okay, the second equation is coming from the fact that um, 10 I naught plus 50 Ix equals to 120. Okay, I could even solve this by using observations. I can cancel the factor of 10. So I naught plus five Ix equals to 12 and then I can make substitutions here and find the value okay find the values of I naught to be negative three amperes okay I naught is negative three amperes and I x is three amperes okay that's the current flowing in the in the uh, 50 ohm resistance Okay, so I assumed I naught to be going from left to right, but the answer led me to a solution, a value of I naught to be negative three amperes. So it means the current is flowing in the opposite direction to what I initially assumed, but I don't have to make any changes. I can just leave it like so, and then um, signify the fact that I naught is negative three amperes, meaning that it's actually flowing in the opposite direction, okay? And then the textbook, it's an example problem in the textbook. The textbook asks you to verify if your answer is correct or not, okay? By calculating the power in each of these. So what you would do is you look at the power in this resistance, V or I squared. Okay, let's see, I squared R. In the resistance 10 ohm and then I squared R that's the power dissipated in the 50 ohm resistance okay and you have the value of I X squared and you have the value of I naught squared so the power dissipated in these two resistances 
you should also look at the power in this guy, which is going to be 120 volts V times I negative three amperes. So you can do the math and you can also look at the voltage across these two terminals and then multiply that by, um, multiply that by the current, okay? So the idea is the total power that is delivered will be equals to the, will be equal to the power that is absorbed by the voltage source and then the power that is dissipated in each of these resistances, okay? So that's the idea. You can verify that your answer is correct by looking at the total power dissipated and the total power absorbed, okay? And put total power delivered, okay? That's a simple problem. Let's see if we can do one more problem. Let's see if we can do this problem, okay? The idea is given I naught to be two amperes, I naught is this guy, okay? The current on the extreme right, okay? 20 ohm resistance. The current in the 20 ohm resistance is given to be, that current I naught is given to be two amperes. And we are supposed to find I1. That's the current in the middle branch, the branch in the middle. Okay, so this is what I will tell you before we actually begin the circuit. Or why don't I solve this problem for us? Okay, rather than having you solve this problem, I want to walk through this problem. Okay, let's walk through this problem solution. Even before we go on to set up KVL and KCL equations, do we know the value for V2 already from what is given? Yes. That's going to be I times R, Ohm's law, right? So it's going to be two amperes, which is I naught times 20 ohms. That's going to be 40 volts, okay? So V2, the voltage across the 20 ohm resistance is 40 volts, okay? So here is the argument I'm going to make, okay? If you look at this resistance, look at the resistance on the top branch, what's the voltage on the right terminal of that guy? Well, that's the same voltage as this guy, right? So the voltage at this terminal of a resistance is the same as this voltage, which I just found out to be 40 volts, right? This is the voltage across this guy is 40 volts, right? So this is the voltage at that node is 40 volts. And what else do I know? Do I know the voltage on the other side this resistance. Sure enough, I know this voltage source is putting out a voltage of 80 volts here. So this guy is 80 volts. This guy is 40 volts. So I know the voltage across this resistance. So the voltage across the 8 ohms resistance, V8 ohms, so that's plus minus V8 ohms, the voltage across that is the voltage on the left minus the voltage on the right. That's 40 volts. Everybody with me? Yes. Now, because I know the voltage across the resistance, I should be able to calculate the current I2. Okay, which is simply V8 ohms over R, which is 40 volts by um, 40 volts by 8 ohms, so it's going to be 5 amperes. So my effort has been to look at the circuit just by observation and see if I can solve 
for some of the unknowns, even without having to take a deep dive into the equations. Okay. What else? What else can I do here? Okay. So it turns out, so this is, oops, excuse me, sorry about that. So now it turns out that I know the value of the current coming into this match, I2. I know the current leaving this branch, I naught. So it would make sense to look at this node. I don't know, let's call this node A. Okay, let's apply KCL at node A. I want to apply KCL at node A because I have a feeling that it's going to give out the value for one more unknown term, okay? Let's see if I can write the expression uh, for KCL at node A. So the currents coming in is I2 plus I3. That should equal the current going out, which is I0. Everybody with me? So from this, I know the value of I0 to be two amperes. I know the value of I2 to be five amperes. So I should be able to, so this is known, this is known to be five amperes plus I3 equals to two amperes, which means I3 equals to negative three amperes. Okay, so here are some, inter, some results, intermediate results. Okay, so that's one result, I2. It is another result, I3, okay? There is a V2 found out to be. So I know this current, I3 as well, okay? I know the value for I3 as well. Now, what I'm going to do is to apply Ohm's law. So this is, earlier what we did was applying Ohm's law. So I'm going to apply Ohm's law again. Ohm's law for the four ohm resistance here. Okay, let me call this R just just to um, just to give it a name so it's easy to identify. Let me call it R A for resistance R A. Okay, if I look at the resistance R A. I know voltage on the right hand side of that guy. That's 40 volts. That's what we calculated in the very first step. Okay. And um, I know the current through this guy. So if I were to call this guy as V4, VRA or V4 ohms, V R A. Okay, that's V. Let me carry this up. Just give me a second. Okay, never mind. So here is the idea. Um, let's call this node as the R just some arbitrary name, okay? So VR minus 40 volts, that's the voltage across the sky, is going to be I3 times four ohms, or RA, okay? RA. Which is, I3, I know the value of I3, negative three amperes. I know the value of RA, which is four ohms. So I should be able to calculate the voltage for this node VR. Okay, the voltage across that resistance, VR. Okay, VR. So VR should give me, um, Let's see. VR, or, or it's simply, it's same as V1, 
right? That's the voltage across the resistance here. So this guy is V1. Okay, V1 minus 40 volts. That's the voltage across the this resistance here. The voltage across that resistance is the voltage on the left minus the voltage on the right. The voltage on the right is 40 volts. The voltage on the left is V1. Okay, so V1 is going to come out to be V1 is going to come out to be um, a value of 28 volts. Okay, why do you think I'm interested in calculating V1 at all? Okay, the reason is simple because my eventual effort has been to find out the value of I1. Okay to find the value of I1. If I know the voltage at V1, then I should be able to calculate the voltage, um, the, the voltage dropped across V1, and then, and then use Ohm's law. So V1 is 28 volts. So I, I apply Ohm's law again for this resistance, for the resistance here. Let me call that Rb. Okay, I'll call this resistance as Rb, Ohm's law for Rb. Ohm's law for Rb tells me that the voltage across this guy is I times Rb, okay, from which I should be able to calculate the value of I1. Okay, make sense? Yep. Okay. I used a, I used a Ohm's law and KCL a bunch of different times. Okay, so I don't have to apply KVL. So this value I1 is going to come out to be um, seven amperes. Okay, I1 is going to come out to be seven amperes. So that's for one part of the problem that you have been asked to find. Okay, I1 is seven amperes. Now, the next part of the problem says, find the power dissipated in each resistance. So in other words, it's asking you to find the value of current through each of the resistances, okay? So I have to find I4 so that I can multiply I squared times 13. I find out I3, which I think I have a value for already. Okay, I found out I1, I already found out I0, and then I found out I2. So if I can find out the value of I4, I know um, the currents flowing through all the resistances. Okay, I know the current flowing through I1, I know the current I2, I3, and I0. So it only remains to find the value of I4. Okay, let me see if I can copy this. Copy this guy. Add a page here. Okay, paste here. Okay, let's see. In order to find I4, okay, what I can do is to set up KCL at this node. Okay, if I can set up KCL at this node, okay, I have two currents leaving and one current entering. So KCL at node, let me call this A, or we already call this V1, right? V1, let's stick to that. KCL at node V1, okay, at node V1. This node, the current coming in is I4. That should equal the currents going out, which is I3 to the right and I1 south, going south. And it should give you a value of I4 to be I4 to be I3 plus. I3 is uh, negative three amperes, I1 is seven amperes, so this guy is going to be four amperes, okay? Now, you have all the information necessary 
to calculate part two. Okay, let's let me first do this. Okay, in part two, we have been asked to do this. In part two, we have been asked to calculate the power dissipated in each of the resistors. Okay, so if you want to calculate the power dissipated in, in this resistance, all you have to do is do I4 squared times 13. That will give you, that's I squared times R, right? It will give you I4 is, um, four, I4 is four amperes. So you can do the math. Similarly, if you want to find the current flowing through the eight ohm resistance on the top, you simply have to do I2 squared times eight ohms, okay? And then that will give you the value for the power dissipated in the eight ohm resistance, okay? So on and so forth. Questions? So it's just a matter of doing the math at this point. I squared times R. Make sense? And when you add up all the powers that are dissipated in the resistances, that will exactly equal the current IG uh, or, or the power um, supplied by the 80 volts, 80 volts power supply. Okay, so that's the idea. All right, questions please, questions so far. What questions do you have at this time? Okay, so I'm going to summarize the idea of applying KCL and KVL here really quickly. Let me see if I can give you the general approach to doing the KCL KVL, okay? Let me go back all the way to the beginning, even before we begin the example problems. So right here, I'm going to add a page. Okay, give you the general approach. Okay. When we are applying KCL and KVL, what we typically do, and sometimes it, I may not have shown this explicitly, is to set up directions for voltage and current, okay? We set up directions for voltage and current, just like this, okay? This is what we did. I assumed a positive and negative direction, and I defined a current flowing from left to right. That's an assumption I made, right? And I stick to that throughout the problem. So the first thing I want to do is to set up the directions for voltages and currents in one form. In a, it does not matter. I could have done the exact same thing. I could have done plus minus I4. Okay, and then I would still have arrived at the exact same right answer, okay? It does not matter. So the important thing is I want to set up the directions at the beginning of the problem and stick to that directions throughout, okay? So the first thing to do is to set up directions for voltages and currents, then identify unknowns. Okay, the third thing is to um, look at the number of nodes and see if you can set up KCL at the nodes. Okay, and then you carefully, judiciously, you judiciously set up KVL at relevant nodes, okay, around loops, I'm sorry, KVL around loops, 
And you're not going to do this blindly. You're going to be very wise in picking which loops to use. That way you can get a lot of mileage, a lot of information out of just one equation. Okay, then you have enough number of equations between step three and step four, then solve equations for unknowns. Okay, so that's the generic procedure that we apply to um, solve using KCL and KPI. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And what I'm going to do is now move on to talking about KCL and KVL using, using dependent sources. Okay, dependent sources. So we looked at enough examples. It appears we looked at four examples um, for KCL and KVL. So let's see if we can look at a couple of examples using dependent sources. Okay, in dependent sources, the process is still very, very similar, except that you have just one more um, equation that comes up from the dependent constraint. Okay, you have one more equation that comes out from the dependent constraint. Okay, I'll show you an example. Here is a, um, a circuit that involves a dependent source on the extreme right. I want you to look at that. Take a minute to look at that circuit and tell me um, if it is, what kind, of, what kind of dependent source that is. What kind of a dependent source is that? It's a VCCS. It's a VCCS is one answer. Any other answers? Okay. Let's see. Um, you see the arrow right here. It's a current source, sure enough. So that part is exactly right, current source. But the current source is dependent on some variable I delta. I delta, what is I delta? That's current, right? So the output five times some variable is dependent on a current variable I delta. Therefore, it appears like it's a current controlled current source. Does that make sense? Because the variable, remember the output, if you remember the equation that I gave you output is some gain times some input, okay? The output determines the current source, sure enough, the output is a current shown by this arrow here, great. So that's a current source. What's the input? The input is this guy, okay? That's this value here. That's this um, variable here, I delta, which is a current. So it's a current control current source, okay? I have a current control current source here. All right, so let's see how we can um, use this current control current source. And I believe I have the circuit diagram for this somewhere down below. No? So I'm going to copy this over and see if we can solve this. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to call, copy this. No? No. Okay. Let me try one more time. Copy that and paste. Thank you. So here is the idea. The problem is to find all the unknown voltages and currents, okay, using a dependent source. Well, it's not too difficult. It's just that I have to apply an additional step, 
Okay, so first of all, um, the currents and the voltage directions are fortunately defined for me already in this problem. Okay, the current is defined I delta. This current is defined to be five I delta and the current going down south is given to be I naught. So I have the um, voltages and currents. So problem is example. Example number five using dependent sources. Okay, what I'm going to do is to set up KCR. Okay, step number one here is to set up KCL at node B. Okay, this follows the exact same procedure that we have been following so far at node B. Okay, what are the currents coming in? Well, there is one current coming in from the left, which is five I delta. And there is one coming in from the right, one I delta. So the currents coming in I delta plus five I delta should equal the current going out, which is I naught, okay, which is I naught. So six I delta is I naught is one equation I got, okay, is equation one I got, okay. Then what I'm going to do is to set up, okay, is to set up a KCL or KVL around this loop, okay. Because that takes care of all the nodes I have, okay. Then I can't get any more KCL equation. So the next step I'm going to do is to, step number two is KVL around loop alpha, okay. I'm going to call this as loop alpha, okay. The process is to begin with the lower left corner and follow a, uh, a clockwise path and account for all the voltage drops in that loop. So the first thing I'm going to see is negative 500 volts. Okay, when I begin at the lower left corner, then there's a plus minus here. So plus five ohms times I delta right, plus VO times I naught. All of that should equal zero. Okay, KVL around loop alpha. Okay, so this gives me a second equation. Okay, this gives me an equation that appears like 500 equals to five I delta plus five I delta plus B O times I naught. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to... Um, professor, I have a question. Yes. For the KVL around loop alpha, um, should it be um, the current times the resistance to get the voltage, not V naught times I naught. Sorry about that. Sorry, thank you. That's a that's a sharp observation. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that's good. It's twenty ohms times I naught. Okay, that's twenty times I naught. So I naught. From the equation above, I'm going to replace with six I delta and get a value for I delta. So it's a matter of solving these two equations now, okay? Two equations and two unknowns, I naught and I delta. These are the two unknowns, okay? Now I naught is going to come out to be, I naught is going to come out to be 24 amperes, okay? I delta, is going to come out to be four amperes and the five I delta is going to be, that's going to be 
the current in the rightmost branch is going to be 20 amperes. Okay, so there's just one constraint equation, phi i delta. Okay, that's the only constraint equation that uh, takes into account the dependent current source. Okay, so the process is exactly the same. All I have done is just to use, instead of using a value for this current source, I use an expression. Okay, let's see if we can solve one more problem based on this. Questions, questions please. That's good. Okay, perfect. Good, good, good. So let's see if we can do one more problem. KCL, KVL, example problem number six. Okay, the question asks, find the value of I naught Okay, find the value of I1. Okay, what's the value of I1? And what's the value of I2 in this problem? Okay, that's the um, I1. So I'm asked, supposed to find out the current here and current there. Okay, take a couple of minutes to think about how you would solve. And I'm going to, as a matter of fact, do this. I'm going to erase this part. Okay, because that's, Something I don't know yet. Okay, that's something I don't know yet. All I know is this guy is V delta, the current here, I. So let me write it out I here is V delta. over 200. Now, first things first, so this is V delta, okay? What kind of a dependent source is this guy? Okay, if you look at this dependent source, what kind of a dependent source is that? Uh, this one should be VCCS this time, I think. It's a voltage control current source, thank you, that's correct. Voltage control current source, right? It's a VCCS, okay? Now, let's see, um, I'm going to give you a hint, okay? The idea is that the current I naught, you can assume that to be, and you will not be wrong in doing so, to be zero volts, okay? The reason is this current I, that is shown to be coming in from this branch has no path um, backwards, okay? So there's only a single path. So you can assume that the current going in has no way to come out. So there's absolutely no current flowing in, okay? So the assumption is that I naught is zero and that's a fair assumption. because this signal has no path out. If there was a path like so, that would be a different business, okay? But there's no way out for this current um, signal. So there's no path out. So there's no, there's no current flowing there, okay? Let's see if I can uh, name this guy as I3. I'm going to call this guy as I3. And the current IG, that's the same current flowing in here, IG. Yeah, that's the same current flowing here. So let's look at a bunch of nodes. Let's look at this node. Or, or let's say, let's identify the nodes first. There's one node over here, okay. There's one node over here, B. So node A, okay. So node A, okay. And then there's node B. Node B over here, okay. There are two nodes. So let's see if I can set up KCL 
at uh, each of these nodes. So solution. KCL at node A tells me that the current coming in I3 and I0 should equal the current leaving IG. Right? I0 is 0. Okay, so IG equals to I3. Does it make sense? Yes. Now, let's also write that step one. Let's do another step. Step number two is KCL at node B. This could be a little interesting. Okay, when I write the KCL at node B, the currents coming in. Okay, is this guy was supposed to be I1, I2, and Ix. Okay, so let me call this as Ix. Okay. Okay, that's current Ix. So sum of currents coming in Ix plus I1 plus I2. That's going to be the sum of currents going out, which is I0, which is essentially 0. OK. Now, that's step two. There are still unknowns, right? There are still unknowns, and then there, is, there are not enough equations yet. If I find IG, maybe I can find out from uh, knowns, OK? So let's see, that's step two. In step three, this is what I'm going to do. Step number three, okay, in step number three. So this is AG, right? In step number three, I'm going to apply KBL around. Loop alpha where alpha is this guy. Okay, let's see. Okay, okay. You get the idea, right? I don't want to be. Okay, so that's the idea um, around that loop. Okay, so I begin at the lower left corner. Okay, and then take a um, clockwise path and add the voltage drops around this loop. So I begin here, negative. So this is loop alpha, right? Loop alpha. Okay, negative 200 volts plus Ig into 8 kilo ohms plus I3 into 12 kilo ohms, all of that should equal zero, okay? And I3 is the same as Ig, so it's going to come out to give me the value of I3. Okay, I3 to be 0 0.01 amperes or 10 milliampers. Okay. Questions, please. Okay. I applied KVL around loop alpha. Right. Which gave me a value of for I3 equals to. So if I know the value of I3, 
what other information do I know now? I know the value for I3. Um, IG equals 10 milliamps. IG equals to 10 milliamps. Thank you. What else? Do I know the value for V delta? That's simply Ohm's law, right? Yes, it's you can 12... multiply 12 kilo ohms by um, the 10 milliamps to get V delta. So V delta is going to be, V delta is going to be 120 volts. Okay, V delta is going to be a really large number, 120 volts. Okay. Now, let me do this. Let me add a page here. this guy and we want to add this guy so I can see let me see if we can add this guy copy that paste it here okay okay now looked at loop alpha all of that so this is v delta all right. Once I know V delta, I should be able to calculate I X. So this guy is I X, right? I X, okay, which is given to be V delta over 200. So this is called the constraint equation. For dependent source. Once I know V delta, I should be able to calculate I X. I X is given to be V delta over 200. So constraint equation is really the equation that's given to you in the form of a dependent source. So which will come out to some value of 0 0.6 amperes. Okay, Ix comes out to be six amperes. Okay, now we still have two unknowns. We still have two unknowns. So what I'm going to do is to set up a KVL around this loop. Okay, let's see. I'm going to set up a KVL around this loop. Zero point six amperes, and then let me see if I can. On that loop, okay. On that loop, let me call this loop beta. Okay, so KVL around loop beta. Okay, when I set up KVL around loop beta, begin at the lower left corner and follow a clockwise path along that loop. So this guy was positive and this guy was negative. Remember, because my current was flowing in this direction, I1, okay? So I'm going to see negative I1 times nine kilo ohms plus I'm following the loop in this path, okay? The next one is going to be I2 times 
3 kilo ohms, that's going to be zero. Okay, so this is KVL around loop beta. Okay, when I set up KVL around loop beta, it's going to give, tell me that I2 is going to be three times I1. Okay, now it seems I have enough number of equations. So there is equation number, let me go back and look at the equation I had earlier. Okay, this guy, okay, let me highlight this really, really old manner. Okay, that's one equation, equation number one. Okay, here is equation number two. Okay, that's equation number two. Okay, there are two equations and it appears there are three unknowns, all right? Ix, I1, and I2 are the unknowns. I have two equations, but fortunately, if you think about it, this equation, the constraint equation, gave me the value for Ix. So thankfully, I only have two unknowns. So if I write the equation again here, if I copy this guy down here, copy that and paste it down here. So there are two equations and two unknowns, I1 and I2 are unknown. Ix, I know the value of Ix to be 0 0.6 from the dependent source. The dependent source gave me the value for that. Now, if I solve these two equations together, I should get the value for I1 and I2, okay? I1 will come out to be negative 0 0.15 amperes. I2 will come out to be negative 0 0.45 amperes. Okay. Questions, please. Okay, and then of course, I know the value of Ix. I already calculated the value of Ix to be 0 0.6 amperes. Then I, already, I also calculated the value of I3 to be equals to Ig to be equals to 0 0.01. Make sense? So yes. the only thing that appears to be different for this guy, the only thing that appears to be different for the dependent source problem is that you're given an extra variable and an extra equation, okay? That extra equation is given in the problem, like so, Vx equals to V delta, over 200. So in order to solve for this Ix, which is V delta over 200, you need to kind of look at the value for the V delta on the left-hand side, okay? So that's just one extra step that we need to solve for a dependent source but the general procedure is still the same. The general procedure is still the same. And if you go back to look at the problem, the idea was to find the value for I1, I2, and I0. And sure enough, you found the value for I1, I2, and I0. Okay, I0 was zero amperes. Questions, please. What questions do you have? I think I have a question. Sure. 
Um, so when you said that I naught is equal to zero, we can yeah. basically, we can say that whenever we're connecting like these two loops and the current is going in one direction. Correct, and there is no other path to connect these two loops. There's only one connection between two separate loops. And there's no path out. Then I can assume that uh, both the loops are disjoint. Okay. The only thing that's connecting these two loops is really this dependent source. The value of this guy changes based on V delta. So there is a virtual connection. There is no direct connection, but there is a hidden, tacit, unspoken, silent connection um, that changes the values in the right-hand loop based on the voltage in the left-hand. Okay. That's a good question. Any other questions, please? What other questions do you have for me at this time? Okay, so what I'm going to do is to stop here and then I'll see you folks back on Monday. Okay, if I go back to the syllabus, I think I schedule an off day tomorrow because uh, um, we are on pace to covering all the material in time. So I think it makes sense to take a day off tomorrow. I want you to work on the homework problems, homeworks. Let's see. Um, some of these homeworks are going to become available between uh, the day before yesterday and today. Homework two, KCL, KVL is going to become available today. It must have become available already. Homework one, if you did not already start working on it. So this is your um, uh, this is your time. Use tomorrow's class time to work on homeworks. Okay, and any practice problems that you want to look at. I'll see you folks back on Monday then. Thank you. Of course.